This is the second lecture of Unit 4. This is the second half of Chapter 17. We'll be finishing up our discussion of the cytoskeleton here, and we'll be covering pages 590 to 604 in the textbook. We'll begin today's lecture finishing up the three components of the cytoskeleton. Last lecture we talked about intermediate filaments and microtubules, and in this lecture we'll talk about the actin filaments. We'll go a little bit deeper and talk about some of the proteins that bind to actin, We'll discuss how actin contributes to the mobility of the cell. Actin is actually the uh, microtubule, I'm sorry, my, is the cytoskeletal component that allows cells to move, and so we'll talk about that. The protein that binds to actin allowing these types of movement is myosin, so we'll discuss the relationship between myosin and actin proteins, and then we'll wrap the lecture up talking about how myosin and actin work together to allow voluntary muscles to contract. Now, as I already said, actin is the third and smallest of the three components of the cytoskeleton. Actin is found in all eukaryotic cells, and as I alluded to already in the previous slide, if a cell moves, it's due to actin. Actin is responsible for almost every single uh, cellular movement, the movement of a single cell. So without actin, cells could not move. They couldn't crawl along a surface like um, immune system cells do. They couldn't phagocytose certain molecules. They couldn't engulf anything. They couldn't eat anything. Uh, cells couldn't divide after mitosis without actin. Actin is what's responsible for cytokinesis. And so, again, with the small exceptions of flagella and some cilia, which are microtubule dependent, almost all cellular motion depends on actin. Much like microtubules, actin fil filaments are quite unstable. They are more likely to fall apart than to assemble. Uh, what stabilizes actin filaments is, is not the anchoring points. That was the story for the microtubules. But instead, different proteins, accessory proteins, that bind to actin filaments. And that's what stabilizes actin, stops it from falling apart. Actin plays a role in muscle contraction, and this is why actin is stable in muscle. It's stable because the contractile apparatus, the additional proteins that allow muscle, traction, muscle contractions to occur, stabilize the actin filaments in muscle cells. And we'll discuss that later on in this lecture. Now, I don't want to give you the illusion that all actin-based structures are transient, are dynamic, fall apart easily. There are many actin-based cellular structures that are stiff, and they are permanent. Examples of this are the microvilli. You might have heard of microvilli in other classes, especially anatomy and physiology, if you've taken that already. Microvilli are these thin, thin finger-like projections, especially in the small intestine. They increase the surface area of the cell membrane. Uh, they allow cells to absorb nutrients more readily. Microvilli are also uh, involved in sensation in some cases, like in the olfactory cells, uh, the cells that allow us to smell. These microvilli assume this shape because of an actin underlying scaffolding underneath the cell membrane. And those are permanent structures. They are not dynamic. In addition, actin is a member of the cytoskeleton. So there are actin filaments woven through the entire cytoskeleton, and those actins are also permanent. But actin has the ability to be dynamic and temporary. So other structures, such as philopodia and lamellipodia, these are the growing extensions of crawling cells. These are actin-based, and they're very, very transient. They come out and they retract. They come out and they retract. This is the contractile ring that's involved in cytokinesis. This is two cells that have undergone mitosis. They're about to divide. And what pinches one cell into two, what is going to separate these two daughter cells from one another, is a contractile ring made up of actin. And so obviously that's transient as well, because once these two cells have divided, that contractile ring is no longer needed. So whether or not the actin is stable and permanent, or dynamic and temporary depends entirely on these accessory actin binding proteins that bind to and stabilize actin or bind to and disassemble actin. So as you've probably gathered already, actin and microtubules are quite similar in some of their basic properties and they are much more similar to each other than either of those two are to intermediate filaments. Intermediate filaments strength its specialty was strength, was tensile strength and stability. Both microtubules and actin do not have stability going for them. Their strengths lie in other domains, in other regions. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the properties of actin filaments.
If you lose an, use an electron microscope and you take a close look at a cell that contains a great deal of actin, you can visualize the actin filaments. And they look like thread. They look like very, very thin structures. And in fact, they are. They're only 7 nanometers in diameter. Each individual filament of actin is actually a twisted chain of identical globular actin subunits, which have all come together to create a protofilament type structure. So again, very similar to microtubules. And like microtubules, actin filaments have polarity. They have a plus end, and they have a minus end. So we can see, much like microtubules, actin filaments are made of globular spherical monomers that come together to create a single strand or fiber filament with polarity. The difference is that these actin filaments are not hollow, and they're not made up of protofilaments lined side by side, creating a hollow tube. Instead, it's a smaller number of these protofilaments wrapped around each other, almost braided with one, e one another. So actin filaments are not hollow. But they do have polarity. They do have plus and minus ends. They are thinner because of, they're not hollow, so they have a smaller diameter. They're also shorter than microtubules tend to be, and they're much more flexible. Microtubules are like thick cables. They can bend a little bit, but they certainly can't fold in on themselves. Actin filaments are much, much more flexible than a microtubule is. Actin filaments are also much more abundant. Within a cell, the total amount of actin filaments is far, far greater than the total number of microtubules. In addition, separating them from microtubules, actin filaments tend to exist in bundled clusters. Within a cell, there are single microtubule cables that start at the centrosome and attach at some anchoring point. That's a single cable made up of a single microtubule. Actins don't behave that way. Actin filaments bundle together into larger clusters, and those clusters make up actin-based structures in the cell. So now that we have a better idea of the general nature of an actin filament, let's talk about how we make a filament. How are actin filaments polymerized or strung together? So very much like microtubules, actin filaments can grow on either end. So you can add uh, new actin monomers to the minus end or the plus end, but also very similar to microtubules. The growth is easier and more rapid on the plus end of the actin filament. We already alluded to these stabilizing accessory proteins that bind to actin. Without these associated proteins binding to actin filaments, actin filaments become unstable and they disassemble rather easily, and they disassemble from both ends. In fact, each individual actin monomer is bound to ATP. ATP-bound actin monomers more easily incorporate into a growing filament of actin. This should sound awfully familiar. Once the actin monomer is part of the filament, the ATP it is carrying is cleaved. Now it contains ADP. And ADP-containing monomers have much less affinity for being in the filament. So once an actin monomer contains ADP, the strength of its binding to the filament is reduced, and so we promote disassembly or depolymerization. This is the same exact story we told from microtubules, with the single exception that tubulin subunits bound to GTP and GDP. You can remember for the exam how both microtubules and actin assemble into filaments by remembering this general story and just committing to memory that GTP is specific for tubulin and ATP is specific for actin in any event. Also similar to microtubules and very unlike intermediate filaments, actin filaments are dynamic. They must be dynamic. And so this ease of assembling fibers and this willingness and readiness to disassemble spontaneously, that's not an accident. That is evolved. That's necessary so that actin can carry out the cellular functions for which it is responsible. Is it hugely costly in terms of energy? Absolutely. You burn tons and tons of ATP assembling and disassembling actin filaments. That's a lot of energy that goes into this. But again, it is necessary for actin to do the job that it needs to do. Actin filaments are relatively short-lived. They often persist for only a few minutes after they have formed, unless these accessory proteins bind to actin, modify its properties, and cause it to be more stable. About 5% of the total protein in any animal cell is actin. Now let me say that again. 5% of 
all the protein in a given animal cell is just made up of actin. That's a huge slice of the pie. Think of all the proteins we've talked about this semester. RNA polymerase, DNA polymerase, Tata binding protein, capping enzymes, all the receptors in the cell membrane, all the other pro proteins of the cytoskeleton. The list can go on and on. And I, trust me when I say we've only scratched the surface in terms of how many proteins are in the cell. With all of those thousands and thousands of different proteins, 500% by weight, I'm sorry, 5% by weight, 5% of the total protein composition of an animal cell is just actin. Half of that 5% is polymerized into filaments. Half of it is still free monomers. That's a lot of free monomers. What that means is that the concentration of free, non-polymerized actin monomers is pretty high, 50-50 split. Most of the tubulin we find in a cell is incorporated into microtubules. Very little of it is free monomer. This is quite different with respect to actin, and this is intentional. There are proteins, accessory proteins, in the cytosol that bind to these actin monomers and keep them from joining growing actin filaments. These small proteins regulate actin filament polymerization by stopping free actin from joining a growing filament. They keep these actin monomers free, and they keep them in reserve so that when new actin is needed, it can be easily assembled. When that new actin is needed, the new actin filaments, these accessory proteins release their monomers. The actin monomers are now free to assemble into actin filaments, and new filaments are made. But that's an exception to the rule. Most actin binding proteins, most of these accessory proteins we've been referring to, bind to polymerized filaments and stabilize them. So what different kinds of proteins do that? Well, there are actin bundling proteins, which hold actin filaments together in these parallel bundles, almost making a sheet of interwoven connected actin filaments. This sheet will be important for cell crawling, as we'll see in just a second. There are proteins which hold actin into the meshwork of the cell cortex. These cross-linking proteins cause a two-dimensional grid or a two-dimensional uh, woven basket pattern to be formed of actin filaments solely. This provides a great deal of durability to the underlying um, matrix or the underlying protein scaffolding of the cell membrane, very much like the nuclear lamins did in the uh, microtubule and intermediate filament story. Uh, this is what these um, cross-linking proteins are doing for the cell cortex here. There are severing proteins which actually cut actin filaments into smaller pieces. This converts actin into a much more fluid, much less static structure. It almost gives this actin-containing substance a gel-like state. Uh, this tends to thicken up the viscosity of the cytoplasm without making it too static, allowing the cell to move and be a little bit more fluid. And, as we'll see at the very end of the lecture, actin can, like its microtubule cousin, create long tracks, long extended filaments that are used for cellular movement that can be bound by motor proteins, and, and we'll finish the lecture with that story. So um, actin is very, very versatile. Actin can make many different types of structures used for many different types of cellular activities, and which structures actin assumes depends solely on the accessory proteins which bind to it rather than the actin, actin filaments themselves. So we're going to go through each of these examples in a little bit more detail. We'll start with the cell cortex, of course. The cell cortex is a topic that we're familiar with already. We've talked about it in our cell membrane lecture, uh, which was part of exam three, the first lecture of exam three. This is a beautiful, beautiful fluorescent microscopy picture that we have here. We see microtubules stained in green. They are actually forming here the mitotic spindle fibers. In blue are the chromosomes that are undergoing my mitosis being pulled apart. And we see the cell cortex in red. These are actin proteins stained red in this picture. And they, this is the underlying protein framework of the cell membrane. Beautiful picture. So the cell cortex is the protein scaffolding, the actin-based protein scaffolding that supports the cell membrane by lying just underneath it. Of all the regions in the cell, actin is most concentrated just below the cell membrane, at the cytosolic face of the cell membrane, so that it can be the primary component of the cell cortex.
to make the cell cortex, as we saw on the previous slide, actin filaments are simply linked together into a protein meshwork by the specific accessory protein that allows actin to form the cell cortex. In this way, actin filaments provide mechanical strength to the membrane, keeping the entire cell, I was going to say the membrane, but keeping the whole cell in the right shape and allowing that cell to be a little bit more durable. Remember, the cell membrane has the viscosity of olive oil and it's made up solely of phospholipids. The cell membrane itself is quite fragile. It's the cell cortex that adds to the strength of the cell membrane. The cell cortex, again, made up of actin filaments, dictates the shape of the cell and also dictates how much the cell can move. The more robust the cell cortex, the more static, the more non-moving the cell. The more flexible and dynamic the cell cortex, the more the cell can change its shape and move. So in the end, it's the rearrangement of the actin filaments in the cell cortex. And by rearrangement, we mean the ability of that actin to assemble and disassemble. These are the properties that control the cell's ability to change its shape, change its general shape, or by changing its shape so moving, any change in the shape of the cell requires a change in the cortex. And change in the cell cortex requires actin to be dynamic. So for a crawling cell, a crawling cell needs to have its shape to be very, very dynamic. It reaches out these, these well, they're philopodes. We'll talk about them in just a second. But they reach out these structures to see if they want to move in this direction. We have this growing surface of membrane trailing right behind the philopodia. The cell itself kind of flows forward. All of this is a change in cell morphology. All of this is a change in cell's cell shape. And so all of this requires a great deal of dynamic actin assembly, or polymerization, and disassembly. If the a actin was static, if the actin was non-changing, the cell would not move. So, quite literally, the ability of a cell to crawl depends on actin. So let's talk about cell crawling for a moment. Many cells move by crawling. We typically associate this type of movement with amoeba, uh, but all, not all, but many, many different cells, including cells in our body, move in this way. Some examples are the advancing tip of a developing axon. It's called the axon growth cone. Moves forward in this crawling manner that we're about to describe. White blood cells, cells of the immune system, that are attracted to and home in on a point of infection so that they can engulf a foreign pathogen, they move by this crawling mechanism. In all of these cases, whether it's a white blood cell, a growth cone of an axon, or even an amoeba, the cells are crawling towards something. They're not moving randomly. They have been triggered to move, they have been triggered to crawl, and they are moving towards a signal. These cells are sensing an environmental signal. They're sensing a signal molecule that has been released from a particular location. And they are following that signal to some destination. They are migrating towards those molecules using their actin. It's important to note where these concepts that we've been covering intersect. These cells are using actin in order to change their shape and crawl towards this molecular signal. So it really is all one big story of how cells work this semester. Cell crawling is a three-step process. First, the cell pushes out the protrusions, we've already alluded to, these podia, at the leading edge, at the growing edge, the edge by which the cell is crawling. Then, once those protrusions have been sent out, that cellular membrane needs to adhere to whatever surface the cell is crawling on. That's an anchoring point, an attachment point, that keeps the cell from retracting backwards. The third step is that the rest of the cell needs to kind of follow and bring up the rear. So the rest of the cell flows forward to the anchoring point, basically filling in the cell at that advancing front, and then the process repeats. The entire cell has moved up a bit. Now we get these podia reach out, sense that signal, sense where that molecule is coming from, reach out towards that molecule, anchor down so that you don't get retraction, and then the rest of the cell kind of blubs forward and fills in that advancing front. All three of these processes involve actin, but actin is involved in different ways for all three steps. The first step, the reaching out of the cell to sense where the signal is coming from, is driven by the polymerization of new actin filaments. That thin sheet, the advancing front of this crawling surface, uh, is made up of lamellipodia. Lamellipodia are pushed out. They contain a dense meshwork of actin.
And the actin is oriented in a polar way. So it's oriented so that most of the filaments have their plus end close to the plasma membrane. So we'll come back to this figure a couple times, but here is a crawling cell, here is its nucleus. This is the advancing front. So this cell is crawling from left to right, and it's sensing signals that have been released from here. So the cell is crawling towards some signaling molecule that it can sense. The lamellopodia is the thin sheet of the advancing front. It is basically all of the cell that you see here made up of a dense interwoven meshwork of actin filaments shown in red with in general all of their polarity pointing towards the edge of the membrane. The polarity is indicated by these arrowheads pointing towards the plus side. The smaller thinner protrusions that you see on that figure are filopodia. These are the reaching out fingers that come from the lamellopodia, and they also reach upwards. You can see they're trying to show this in three dimensions, but the fingers not only reach out, they reach up as well. These are the filopodia, these small extensions, coming out of the lamellopodia, the advancing sheet of cell membrane. Each filopodia is constructed of actin as well, but actin in a little bit of a different way. Uh, this contains bundled act actin filaments, each filopodia contains a relatively small number of bundled actin filaments, about 10 to 20, as opposed to a dense interwoven sheet of actin that we find in the lamellopodia. The actin and the filopodia are also oriented given their polarity. They have their plus ends pointing outwards, but there's a little bit more organization in the filopodia because the filopodia are these elongated structures. So rather than having an interwoven meshwork of actin, we have bundled actin filaments lying parallel to each other. And again, with all of their plus ends pointing towards the tip of the filopodium. Both lamellopodia and filopodia are highly dynamic and constantly changing. A crawling cell will only send out these structures to a region in the cell where it has sensed its signaling molecule, its chemoattractant. And so there are receptors on the cell surface, all around the cell. The receptors are specific for the signaling molecule. Wherever on the cell the signaling molecule is most concentrated, that portion of the cell begins to become lamellopodia and filopodia. Actin structures form on that top part of the cell, sending out a thin sheet-like cell membrane structure towards the chemoattractant, and then filopodia reach out a little bit more as well. These lamellopodia and filopodia made solely of actin then anchor onto the crawlable surface in the direction that the chemotractin is coming from. It is this actin polymerizing and stabilizing into these cellular structures, lamellopodia and filopodia, that literally forcibly pushes the cell membrane out, dents it outward towards the chemoattractant like a battering ram, battering on the back of the cell membrane, pushing it towards the chemoattractant, dragging the rest of the cell with it. So step one was reaching out towards the molecule, and, and we've covered that just now. Next was anchor. So once these lamellopodia and filopodia do reach out in the direction of the signaling molecule, they then need to anchor themselves. They need to touch down on a crawlable surface and stick to it so that they don't retract back. And the sticking to it needs to be reversible because the cell needs to continue crawling forward. It can't be anchored to that spot permanently. As I said, this is also going to be an actin-dependent process, but it's going to involve actin in a different way. Here, for anchoring, we have transmembrane proteins in the cell membrane called integrins. Integrins allow the anchoring. The integrins are transmembrane proteins with an intracellular side and an extracellular side. The integrins adhere to molecules that are present in the cell's external environment. So the integrins stick to molecules that the cell is crawling on. In this case, we see it's fibronectin. Fibronectin is a component of the extracellular matrix, the ECM. We've been referring to that a little bit more and more frequently as we go along, and we'll be covering it in the next few lectures. But the integrins bind to and anchor to molecules on the crawlable surface. That anchors the cell to the surface on which it's crawling, but these integrins are also anchored inside the cell. Integrins on the intracellular side of the membrane are directly bound to actin filaments. So actin filaments are involved indirectly in the anchoring because the actin filament is bridged to the crawlable surface through integrins. Integrins bridge actin to the surface the cell is crawling on.
That explains step two of cell crawling, the anchoring, also act independent, but not in bundles and not in sheets as we saw for reaching out lamellipodia and philopodia. Step three is that the cell must flow forward. It must all fill in the advancing front. The cell must pull itself along the surface. This involves contractile forces between actin and the motor protein that binds to and moves along actin called myosin. So step three involves actin as an actin-myosin movement contraction, and that's what squeezes the cell forward. So before we talk about myosin, because that's going to lead us directly into muscle contraction, and that's what we want to end with, let's talk a little bit more about signals from the outside world affecting and controlling the arrangement of actin in the cell, because that's really what cell crawling is. External signaling molecules binding to cellular receptors, not only changing the physiology of the cell, but causing the cell to move, causing the cell's actin to rearrange. So let's discuss that before we move on to contractile forces and myosin. So hopefully at this point we can appreciate the fact that although myosin, which we haven't really formally defined yet, but we've alluded to, although myosin and other actin binding proteins regulate the structures that actin takes and the behavior it can be responsible for, everything in the cell is responding to extracellular cues. Right? The actin is dynamic because of extracellular cues. The cell might be moving because of extracellular cues. We've referred to extracellular cues in earlier lectures and other f effects it can have on a cell. In this case, the cell rearranges its entire cytoskeleton in response to extracellular cues, in response to signaling molecules that are coming in from the environment. These cues are the signaling molecules. They are rebinding to cell surface receptors. So the cell responses to these signals are mediated by receptor proteins. Regardless of the signal, the molecule that's conveying the signal, regardless of the receptor it binds to, all of the cues that come into a cell that affect actin polymerization and actin behavior always eventually culminate on a single GTP binding protein called Rho. Rho is a small G protein, very much like RAS, so we're going to be already roughly familiar with how Rho behaves. And when Rho takes on GTP, becoming active, Rho is responsible for triggering actin polymerization and actin bundling into philopodia. Okay, so that helps with step one of the crawling process. It also triggers lamellipodia formation, Rho also, when active, triggers actin-myosin interactions to promote the actual moving of the cell, the crawling of the cell to the contact points. In fact, the only thing Rho isn't responsible for is the integrin anchoring. All other components of cell crawling are Rho-mediated. So Rho is a small g protein active when it takes on GTP, and Rho is signaled to take on GTP when receptors bind to the appropriate signaling molecules triggering the cell to crawl. The effects of Rho cell-wide are so apparent in this figure. On the left, in A, we have cells that are quiet. Quiescent cells mean quiet cells, cells that aren't responding to any signal. And the glow that we see, the, the staining pattern, is actin. So we see there's quite a bit of actin, very, very dense and concentrated at the cell cortex, right around the underlying surface of the cell membrane. And then we see actin diffuse throughout the cytoplasm as well. But when we activate Rho, look what happens. That actin polymerizes, and it becomes polar. It, becomes, it shows its polarity. See, these actin filaments have now assembled cell-wide, and they are all roughly parallel to each other. The cell has taken on a much more defined structure. This involves the integration of signals from the outside environment. So many, many different signals are arriving at the cell membrane through the receptors from the outside environment. All of those signals need to be integrated, much like the signals for transcription were integrated by mediator. Those signals need to be integrated, summed together, weighed against one another. This is combined now with cues coming from inside the cell. Intracellular cues are revolving around cell health, energy levels, how close or how far we are from the next round of cell division. So we have extracellular cues, many, many of them, intracellular cues, many, many of them, integrating together, coming together, and ultimately affecting Rho. If Rho becomes active, the cell will crawl.
If Rho does not activate, the cell will not crawl. And so ultimately, the cell's shape and or movement is affected by Rho activation, but Rho activation is the net result of a culmination of many, many different signals from outside and inside the cell. What is allowing these cells to integrate their signals? What is allowing these signals to integrate and culminate at Rho? Crosstalk. Crosstalk, we've talked about at length already, so I won't rehash the details here. I've already said this, so I re apologize for repeating myself, but the inside cues, the intracellular cues, are, revolve around cell health, cell size, its readiness for division, etc. One of the most striking examples of this general type of control, this general idea of cellular movement in an actin-dependent manner, is highlighted by the voluntary muscle contraction, contraction of voluntary muscles. All cellular movement has in common the principles that we will highlight using voluntary muscle contraction, uh, but that is the example that we'll go to. So they all revolve around the manipulation of actin and myosin interaction. So let's begin now to wrap the lecture up by highlighting how actin and myosin associate to form structures that can contract. If you're an actin binding protein and you are a motor protein, you are part of the myosin protein family. There are no other motor proteins that bind to actin other than myosin proteins. All myosin proteins, regardless of what they're responsible for, bind to ATP and cleave ATP, and it is this binding and cleaving of ATP that provides the energy needed for myosin movement along actin cables. Myosins always move in a polar direction along actin from the minus end towards the plus end, and it is the myosin-actin binding and movement that drives all muscle contraction in our body, which I will wrap the lecture up with in just a second. Myosin protein 2 is the major myosin protein type found in muscle cells, whereas myosin protein 1 is the myosin found in all cells. Every single cell must be able to move. Not every single cell needs to contract, but every single cell has to have the ability to crawl and to move and to change its shape. So all cells contain myosin 1, allowing those cellular morphological changes that require actin. Myosin 1 is simpler, and so we'll discuss it first as uh, a way to kind of talk about the basics of myosin, and then we'll move on to more complicated muscle contraction. Myosin 1, as well as myosin 2, but myosin 1 is made up of a head domain and a tail domain. We've seen this idea before. The head domain is the domain that binds to the actin filament as well as bind to and cleave ATP. So most of the nuts and bolts operations of myosin occur in the head domain. The tail domains differ between individual proteins of myosin, but it's the tail that determines what the myosin protein will bind to. Is it binding to a vesicle and transporting cargo? Is it binding to the cell membrane and causing the cell to crawl? So, highlighted in this schematic, I think this shows it best. Whoops, sorry. We have the actin filament here, actin filament. The head region of myosin binds to the actin filament, also responsible for the movement and the ATP cleavage. The tail region of the myosin film of the myosin protein binds to whatever it is the myosin is trying to move. If it's trying to transport a vesicle, the tail region will bind to that. If the myosin is trying to move the cell itself, well, what the myosin tail wants to bind to is the cell membrane. By pulling on the cell membrane, you cause the cell to move, to crawl. And so whatever is being moved by myosin is what the tail interacts with. Interestingly, myosin is quite simple in its general structure and movement. It actually behaves very much like an, a human arm or, or any uh, joint, pivotal joint. Myosin tails contain two rigid planks, two rigid protein domains. They're often referred to as lever arms, connected by a movable joint. It is this movable joint that, when it moves, pivots these two rigid planks relative to one another, and that movement only occurs when the ATP is hydrolyzed, releasing energy. So when ATP is hydrolyzed, the lever arm, one of those planks, protrudes straight out from the head domain of myosin. So we might see that right here in this structure. Here's the head domain in, lev in yellow, and this lever arm, this tail, is protruding generally straight out of that head group. But when the ATP is hydrolyzed, or after it's hydrolyzed, and it's been converted into ADP, the lever arm rotates. It rotates almost 90 degrees, and it bends. So now the head domain and the lever arm, the head domain and the tail, 
are in a different configuration, not so much straight, but bent. That's the movement that myosin is responsible for. Now this is a fairly complicated process, so ATP hydrolysis has another effect as well. The binding of ATP itself significantly decreases myosin's ability to bind to actin. However, when that ATP is hydrolyzed and, and myosin is bound to ADP, its affinity for actin goes way, way up, and the myosin protein rebinds to the actin filament. We're going to end this explanation and end this lecture, in fact, with this idea of a bind, pull, release mechanism of motion. And it is the binding and release due to ATP and ADP binding by myosin that al allows both the binding and releasing of myosin and the pulling, of course, of the movement of the lever arm. But we'll explain all that in just a second. So that is, in general, what myosin can do. And that's true for all myosin groups and all myosin families, myosin moving things along actin filaments. Let's get to the real details of this by talking about muscle contraction. In muscle, myosin and actin work together for the contraction of muscle fibers. Voluntary muscle, these are the skeletal muscles that we can control with our thoughts, with our wishes, are striated. These are called the striated muscles. And they're called striated because, under the microscope, they are just that. They are striped or striated. The smallest functional unit of muscle is called the sarcomere. So let's get an idea of what that is. We see here a single muscle fiber. Muscle fibers are bundled together to make muscle tissue, but this is a single muscle fiber. A muscle fiber is itself a bundle of myofibrils that are clustered together by a plasma membrane. The myofibrils are made up of individual sarcomeres linked end to end. One sarcomere, two sarcomeres, three, four, five, six. These sarcomeres come together to make a single myofibril. Myofibrils are bundled together to make a muscle fiber. Muscle fibers are bundled together to make a muscle, a tendon, a ligament, etc. A single sarcomere is striated, giving the muscle itself this striped appearance. We see regions that are very, very light, regions that are darker or denser, and then densest regions in the middle. This banding or intensity pattern of a sarcomere actually is so because it illustrates the functional nature of muscle. You see, muscle contractions are achieved when thin filaments that we see here slide along and integrate or interlock into thick filaments, which we see here. So we can kind of parse out this sarcomere. This is a true micrograph of a sarcomere. We can parse it out and see that the thick filaments are here in the center making up this darker pattern. The thin filaments are so thin that we can hardly see them, so they make up the lighter pattern on the ends of the sarcomere. In the middle, where it's darkest, it's actually darkest because this is the only region where the thin and thick are together or interlocked, making it even darker than the thick filaments itself. To put this into the context of the cytoskeleton, these thin filaments are actin only. The thick filaments are myosin, and the thickest or darkest pattern of the sarcomere is where both actin and myosin have interlocked. Very interesting, I think. Let's talk a little bit more about the thick filaments, however, so we can kind of wrap our mind around it. A single myosin-2 protein is actually composed of two individual myosin monomers that have been bundled and twisted together. So this is a single myosin-2 protein. The thick filament are many, many, many single myosin-2 molecules bundled together as well. So you see that here, I hope. Each of these little blips is a myosin-2, and they have been braided and interlocked together to make this thick filament. The thick filament is in the center of the sarcomere, just as we see here, made up of many, many, many myosin-2 molecules, individual myosin-2 molecules. And the actin filaments, the thinnest filaments, are here on the ends of the sarcomere. So to bring this picture back, now we have some relevance. The end of the sarcomere is represented here by these Z disks. The faintest part of the sarcomere is just actin filaments. In the center, we have these thick filaments made up of nothing more than myosin-2 bundles. And where they are darkest is where the myosin and the actin both exist. When this sarcomere is relaxed, most of the actin has pulled away from the myosin. When this muscle contracts, the myosin is drawn inward. That's the contraction. And the entire sarcomere reduces its width. It 
squinches. It contracts to take up a smaller size. This is the true sarcomere. If you remember from that myofibril figure I showed a little while ago, I'll zip right back to that. The myofibril is actually a cylinder. It's rounded. So the true sarcomere actually exists in this shape. But we have in red the thick filaments of myosin, in blue is the actin filaments. This is the relaxed muscle, so there's quite a bit of actin not associated with myosin. But then for the contraction, the myosin draws the actin filaments inward, squeezing the sarcomere down to a smaller width. That is the contracted muscle, tight muscle, made smaller, contracted. So to recap in text, the thick filaments are actually nothing more than individual myosin-2 molecules self-assembled and intertwined into a thick bundle of myosin that have head domains all throughout them. So a little bit different than the figure I showed before, but this is a very good representation of a thick myosin filament. Individual myosin molecules shown here with their head regions poking out, bundled and twisted together to make a thick filament. In fact, this is exactly what myosin thick filaments look like under an electron microscope. This is a real photograph of a myosin thick filament, and compare it to the schematic, you can definitely see the similarity in structure. On each thick filament of myosin, there are about 500 individual head domains. Each head rich region on both ends is associated with two actin filaments each, one above and one below. And so again, we have thick filaments in the center associated with thin actin filaments on either side. Each individual head domain interacts with an actin filament and provides the force for pulling that actin filament inward, sliding the actin inward, contracting and squeezing the sarcomere. So this is the released sarcomere, the relaxed form, thick filament in the center, here's all your myosin heads, actin filaments on the end, and then the actin filament is bound by myosin. Myosin binds to that filament and pulls in, binds it and pulls in, binds it and pulls in, pulling those actin, actin filaments towards the center of the sarcomere, squeezing or contracting the sarcomere itself, contracting the muscle. This is exactly what's happening. This is probably the best way to show it. I hope that this animation is visible on Tegrity. I'll take a look after I finish uploading the lecture to make sure that it captures it. But let me show that again, if I can. We have the thick myosin filaments in the center, the actin filaments in red. And as those myosin heads bind to actin and pull, bind to actin and pull, bind to actin and pull, those actin filaments are being pulled towards the center of the sarcomere, and the width of the sarcomere decreases. That is the muscle contraction. So how does ATP figure into all of this? Remember, this is all ATP dependent. Well. If we add ATP to a solution of myosin and actin, what we see is that the myosin releases all the actin. It lets go of all the actin. The actin filaments dissociate from the myosin. And that supports the idea that we said before, which is that myosin bound to ATP has a decreased affinity for binding to actin. But it makes no sense whatsoever when considering how is this an ATP dependent process Myosin has to bind to the actin to pull it in towards the center of the sarcomere, yet when we provide the energy, all myosin does is let go of the actin. So that implies that actin hy ATP hydrolysis alone can't directly be powering the movement of myosin on actin. Certainly myosin binding and pulling on actin requires energy, but ATP hydrolysis alone can't be solely responsible because when we add ATP, myosin lets go of actin doesn't bind it and pull it. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on is kind of an indirect movement that allows the bind-pull-release mechanism. When ATP binds to a myosin head, the myosin head lets go of actin, as shown here. In addition, when ATP binds to myosin, that lever arm straightens back to its original conformation. So we let go of actin and we move our lever arm. We let go of actin and move the lever arm. Then, then, the ATP is hydrolyzed. The ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP. Okay, 
the phosphate that we cut off going from adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate, that phosphate that we cut off is still in the myosin head, but it has been separated. So the myosin is now bound to ADP and a free phosphate. Once that ATP has been hydrolyzed and the myosin is bound to ADP, the affinity for actin has gone up, so the myosin head rebinds to actin. Lastly, when the phosphate, the free phosphate that we just cut off of ATP is released, that causes the lever arm to shift backwards, moving the myosin filament relative to the actin filament, or moving actin relative to myosin is probably the better way to say it. This is the power stroke of myosin, and it relies not on ATP cleavage, but on phosphate release. Let's go through that again. We start with just ADP, a static myosin bound to actin. That myosin lets go of ADP and takes on ATP. Once ATP is bound, two things happen. Myosin lets go of actin, and the lever arm shifts forward. Now the ATP is cleaved to ADP and the extra phosphate that was just cut off. That causes the myosin head to rebind to actin. And then when the phosphate is released, the lever arm moves, powering actin, moving actin relative to myosin. That is the power stroke of myosin movement. So this cycle repeats. Release, straighten, bind, power stroke. Release, straighten, bind, power stroke. Bind, pull, release. Or release... Bind, pull. Anybody who's familiar with crew understands how myosin interacts with actin. You pull the paddle out of the water. That's the release of the interaction. You put the paddle in the water. You're binding the paddle to the water, and then you heave. You pull the paddle out of the water. And when you're on a crew team or in a rowboat, when you pull the paddle out of the water, that's when you move the paddle. right? You pull the paddle out of the water, and you reposition the paddle with the paddle out of the water. That's the paddle out of the water, and the repositioning. Then you put the paddle in the water, bind, and then you pull to move the boat. Power stroke. Paddle out of the water, reposition the paddle, paddle in the water, pull. Bind ATP, cleave ATP, release the phosphate, pull. It's the same exact mechanism. But again, we're all describing here one single myosin protein on one single actin fiber. What we're trying to understand is how we contract an entire muscle made up of thousands of sarcomeres in millions of myofibrils. This is the result of hundreds and hundreds of head domains projecting out from the ends of thick filaments of myosin. In the presence of normal ATP levels, normal physiological ATP levels, ATP levels are pretty, pretty high. Therefore, most of the myosin is actually in the release phase, not attached to actin filaments. Most actin, then, is not bound to the thick filament and fairly free to slide. However, once any of those myosin head groups hydrolyzes ATP, it's going to first bind to that actin and then pull. And that movement moves the actin filament imperceptibly towards the center of the sarcomere. But that's one myosin. Now imagine hundreds of head groups doing that, each hydrolyzing thousands of ATPs per second. Each of those myosin heads is moving an actin filament imperceptibly, sure. But each of the hundreds is moving it imperceptibly. That sums up to quite a bit of movement. Many, many myosin heads, briefly, independently, transiently pulling actin filaments towards the center of the sarcomere, sums up to a whole lot of motion in a short period of time. Because the movement of actin and myosin is fairly uncoordinated, the crew analogy that I just used for a rowboat falls short. Instead, we have to think more of a mosh pit. This fine gentleman here is the actin. And each of the people in the pit are myosin head groups. Their hands are the myosin heads. See, no one person 
is moving this um, crowd surfer forward in all that dramatic a fashion, right? Each person is really just supporting and moving him imperceptibly towards the stage, little by little. But enough people reach up, enough people support him, enough people move him forward, and he moves in a positive direction towards the stage. If enough myosin heads imperceptibly bind to, support, and pull on actin, if enough of them do it, you will get a concerted motion in a single direction towards the center of the sarcomere, and the muscle will contract. So it's great that this is the way that muscles contract, and it's great that this is the way that myosin can pull an actin filament and pull and pull and keep pulling until that sarcomere contracts. But it also makes sense that muscle contracted be regulated in some way. This isn't something that you want to happen all on its own. This is something that you want to be controllable, to be regulated. So the movement that we've just described for muscle contractions are regulated and controlled by nerve impulses. And we won't talk about the neurological side of this, that's for other courses, but we will talk about how muscle contraction is controlled at the sarcomere. And it involves two proteins, one called tropomyosin and the other one called troponin. When a muscle is inactive, that is, when a sarcomere, a muscle fiber, is not getting the signals to contract, tropomyosin is actually repressive. I don't mean repressive the way that repressors turn genes off, but it, it, tropomyosin blocks the interaction between myosin and actin, inhibiting the muscle's ability to contract. When a muscle fiber gets hit with a nerve impulse, when a muscle fiber is excited or triggered by a nerve impulse arriving at it, the main result in that is that calcium is released in the muscle fiber. Troponin senses this calcium, and by sensing or binding to this calcium, troponin relieves and bypasses the inhibition of myosin-actin interactions by getting tropomyosin out of the way. So tropomyosin is blocking these interactions. When the muscle fiber gets hit with a nerve impulse, calcium is released in the muscle fiber, and that calcium allows troponin to move the blocking tropomyosin out of the way, and so myosin and actin can interact. So we're going to watch a quick movie here again, like the previous animation. I hope that this movie shows well on the um, integrity demonstration. If it doesn't, then I'll show this in class. Just somebody ask me through Canvas. But we're going to have a number of players here. We're going to have myosin, which is changing its conformation of the lever arm, so it's binding, pulling, and releasing. We have actin fibers, of course. Tropomyosin is going to appear as a purple thread. The energy of ATP is going to be involved in the pull, bind, release mechanism. And troponin is going to be shown here in a lighter purple, bound by and not bound by calcium. So let's, let's see what happens. There's a lot going on in this animation, and I'd like to take our time and talk through it. <clears throat> Excuse me. First off, let's just pay attention to the myosin head and the actin filament itself. So the myosin lets go of the actin as soon as ATP has bound. When ATP is cleaved in half, we see the myosin head re-engage with the actin filament. Then when the free phosphate is released, we see the pulling or the changing in the conformation of the myosin. So watch that for a moment. We have bind, pull, release with new ATP. Bind with cleavage, pull with the release of the phosphate, and then release with new ATP. So that's going on and on and on. We're going to ignore the magnesium role in this process for today. Now, look at the tropomyosin. The tropomyosin is actually blocking myosin's ability to bind to the actin filament. See how it's in the way? But when calcium comes in and binds to troponin, watch what troponin does. It shifts, and it pulls the tropomyosin out of the way so that there is exposed, myosin, uh, exposed actin for myosin to bind to. If calcium was not released in this muscle fiber, this troponin would not shift, and tropomyosin would remain in the way, blocking myosin's ability to, act, to interact with the actin. But since this muscle fiber is receiving a nerve impulse, and calcium is being released in this nerve fiber, the calcium binds to troponin, the troponin pulls the tropomyosin out of the way, and then with fresh ATP bound, then cleave to ADP, the myosin head can interact with that actin filament. When the free phosphate is released, as it is going to be right here, the myosin pulls on that actin filament, and then when fresh ATP binds to the myosin head as it is right there, the myosin head releases the actin. So what we're watching in this movie is a single myosin 
interacting on a single actin polymer. Calcium binds to the troponin. The troponin causes a shift. It drags with it tropomyosin to twist out of the way, exposing free actin filaments to which myosin can bind. If there is no calcium, myosin cannot bind to the actin filament. There will be no contraction, because remember, this is happening with hundreds and hundreds of myosin heads playing that crowd surfer mosh pit game with all of these actin filaments. If there's no contraction, there's no squeezing of the muscle fiber, this is regulation. The default state of a muscle fiber is to not contract because troponin and tropomyosin are constantly inhibitory. When the signal for contraction is received, that's a calcium dependent signal, and we see contraction of the sarcomere. Wonderful, wonderful stories here. So let's summarize what we talked about in this lecture. We've started talking about just actin as the third component of the cytoskeleton. And we talked first about its general arrangement. So actin filaments are twisted chains of identical globular actin subunits put end to end. They have polarity. They're all oriented in the same direction. And so very much like microtubules, actin filaments have plus and minus ends. Each free actin monomer, those are the individual globular proteins that make up an actin filament, is bound to ATP. It is the ATP bound form of actin monomers that are easily incorporated into growing filaments, but once those monomers are part of a filament, the ATP is cleaved to ADP, and this promotes disassembly of the actin filament. Actin is most concentrated at the cytosolic face of the cell membrane, where it plays a role contributing to the cell cortex. But actin is also playing a role in cell crawling, in actually all forms of cell movement. But cell crawling is one example of that. Cell crawling is an active dependent process. It is a three-step process where actin is part of each of the three steps in a different way. And we went through those steps in some detail. Once lamellipodia and uh, philopodia have been sent out in an actin way to kind of probe that environment, those structures of the cell have to adhere to the crawling surface. And that adherence is due to proteins called integrins. Integrins are transmembrane proteins which bridge the actin filaments within the cell to the crawling surface, to the, the cellular components, extracellular components that the cell is crawling on. And so this is the anchoring portion of cell crawling. Then, using myosin to drive cell movement in an actin-dependent way, the whole cell flows forward to those adhesion points, and that is how cells crawl. But we didn't leave myosin at that part of the story. We continue talking about myosin. We talked about myosin interacting with actin filaments. So when ATP binds to a myosin head, that's actually uh, a release signal. Myosin lets go of actin when ATP is bound. ATP binding also causes the myosin lever arm, that tail, to re-straighten and recycle back to its original position. Then we have ATP hydrolysis. When ATP is hydrolyzed, two things happen. First, myosin binds to the actin filament, and then with the release of that phosphate, we get movement of the lever arm. That's the power stroke of actin movement. We took those concepts and applied them to muscle cells, to muscle contractions. We defined a myofibril as part of a muscle fiber. We talked about the sarcomere, the thick filaments and thin filaments of the sarcomere. And we saw how in muscle, hundreds and hundreds of myosin heads, all doing this power stroke, sum up to a lot of motion and serve to drag those actin filaments in towards the center of the sarcomere, causing muscle contraction. And we ended the lecture with some brief background on the control of muscle contractions, troponin, tropomyosin, and the relief of that inhibition through uh, calcium, calcium released as a result of a nerve impulse arriving at the muscle fiber. So that's the conclusion of the cytoskeleton material. It's also the end of lecture two for this unit. We have four more lectures to go in which we'll be covering two more chapters. We'll introduce some pretty heavy duty cellular concepts of the cell cycle with our next chapter and um, cover the cell cycle in a total of two chapters. But before we do that, we'll certainly cover this material in our next in-class meeting.